Are y'all ready to spend an incredibly, God willing, edifying evening with me? Well, I hope that you are. It is my hope that you are. And um, if you are tuning in, indeed, this is airing uh, the evening of our Feast of the Queenship of Holy Mary, our Immaculate Mother Mary. We are celebrating this incredibly important feast day, incredibly important title of Mary as Queen of Heaven. Today is the queenship of Mary, very closely tied into the bodily assumption of Holy Mary into heaven. So very, very important feast day, one that tends to get really attacked a lot by those that really don't know better. It is indeed important. So today we're going to look at the biblical basis and the patristic basis as well. This is a really fun and really cool thing is that if you are Hispanic or if you like and enjoy the Spanish language, as you know, We've begun doing a ton of material in Spanish. We have a massive roadmap planned for every video that we do, theologically based, whether it be Mariology, Christology, uh, the Trinity, anything, any video put out, uh, other than, of course, uh, direct responses to English videos, uh, there will be also a Spanish ed edition. So after this airs, <clears throat> depending what time this airs, you all are in for a treat. If you are Spanish, Spanish speaking, a uh, Spanish version will be coming out as well. If, if again, if you appreciate all these things, consider supporting us over at Patreon. We're doing a whole lot of things. We are delving into the Adutor canon as well when it comes to um, uh, the bilingual world. Very important that our Hispanic uh, brothers and sisters, Spanish speaking community, get edified with uh, what we are trying to put out as top-notch scholarly information, brand new translations. And of course, if you do consider supporting this over there, you get access to the videos well before they ever air on my channel, including free books, tons and tons of material. Um, so consider that, God willing, we will be coming out with much more material, much going on in the world of apologetics. We're thrilled to be here with you on this incredibly important feast day, where we're gonna be talking about this title of Holy Mary as Queen of Heaven, but the pushback comes very often when we hear that, look, the only time Queen of Heaven ever appears in the Bible <clears throat> is in a negative way. It's negative, and it's, it's a pagan goddess, Ishtar. As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven. And pour out drink offerings to her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, and our princes. Now, if you look at the, on my channel, you're going to find a, a, uh, a most unfortunate uh, video done by um, uh, Myth Vision, where they just completely butcher um, Mariology. That's been dealt with. So, uh, But the claim will frequently get brought up that Mary, uh, Holy Mary within Catholicism, has become an, an imitation of a pagan goddess. We worship her. We offer worship to her. It is uh, the utmost level of idolatry. And indeed, we have raised this level of idolatry to the uh, the highest because now we've uh, we've applied a pagan title to her. Indeed, if all of this is true, it is embarrassing. How can apostolic Christianity deal with this? Where did they go astray if all of this information is true? Indeed, we're going to find that this information is not true it is absolutely bogus it is unfortunate and with that being said uh let us consider the title is it true that queen of heaven only appears one time in the scripture and it is in a negative connotation the answer is yes and no number one how do we what do we mean by yes we mean yes because the actual uh, words queen of heaven appear in jeremiah 44 verse 17 only there and of course this is in a negative way it, in no way at all does it mean that queen of heaven can never be applicable in a positive sense we're going to see how it indeed can be but the theology of a queen of heaven does not only appear in the book of jeremiah indeed there really is no queen of heaven in the book of jeremiah let us get this theological um, construct down. In the book of Jeremiah, there is no queen of heaven. This is a pagan goddess that has been, uh, they are worshiping, they are offering, offering sacrifice to this pagan goddess. It is a false deity. 
There is no queen of heaven. There rather is idolatrous worship occurring in Jeremiah 44. We need to lay that down immediately. The early church recognized that. That's why the early church had no issue in applying the title of queen of Mary, the queen of heaven, to St. Mary. Very important thing that we've got to recognize. Once we recognize that very important detail, then we have no issue being able to say, okay, well, in what way is St. Mary the Queen of Heaven? In what way are we allowed to call her the Queen of Heaven? In a bit, we'll look at very important writings from the Master uh, uh, Juniper Carroll, great, great writings. We will look at um, uh, fantastic theological constructs that will show that indeed this is biblical and indeed it is ancient. There really should be no problem with it. But the idea that uh, a queen of heaven, uh, the, 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 the idea that royalty, that heavenly royalty is blasphemous, it couldn't be further from the truth. We are presented as the Lord says that we ourselves will be bowed to like royalty. That's an important thing that uh, people tend to forget in Revelation 3. We read that we will be bowed to like royalty. This is an important, very, very important thing that tends to get uh, forgotten. And people tend to just really rip things out of context. That is really unfortunate, but it, it, you find it right here. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Now, a better translation would be, bow before your feet. And indeed, the NRSV does translate it as that. It does. It says, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. So those that are loved by our Lord are treated in a royal fashion. There's nothing idolatrous. There's nothing heretical about that. That is indeed biblical, proceeding found in the book of Revelation. But the idea that there is no true queen of heaven is absolutely ludicrous. St. Mary is presented as the queen of heaven in Revelation 11. She is that new ark of the new covenant in heaven. That great sign directly tied into the sign that was asked for in Isaiah chapter 7. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, this is uh, uh, very indicative of royalty. This woman has a crown of 12 stars. She was with child. Who is the child that she has? We realize this can, is very well applicable to the church as well. But we have to say, even though it is applicable to the church as well, just like the ones that will rule the, rod, the nations with a rod of iron is also applicable to the church. But primarily, it is a Christological uh, uh, duty of our Lord a Christological, the Christological role of our Lord as prefigured in the book of Psalms, primarily Revelation 12 is Mariological as was prefigured in Genesis 3, that enmity between the serpent and the woman. So primarily Genesis 3 is Mariological, even though it can and does have dual imagery there. If anybody says that it cannot, well, how, the, how does uh, prerogatives, duties, powers of our lord also how are they also applied to the church it is absolutely absurd to limit the incredible supernatural nature of scripture on its face primarily we call it mariological because there's only one historical figure only one historical figure who ruled the nations with a rod of iron a male child this is messianic psalm it was spoken of in a messianic psalm that male figure is our Lord and Savior, the Messiah. Thus, Revelation 12 is primarily Mariological, heavily Christological, but very important that we really double down and point out to you that even though Jeremiah 44 has a negative connotation, a fake counterfeit queen of heaven that is worship, we have the true queen of heaven, Saint Mary, in Revelation 12. She is not worshiped, rather, her son, our Lord and Savior, is worshipped, but rather she is given great honor because she is bodily present in heaven. She has a crown of 12 stars indicative of royalty on her head in Revelation 12. This is something very important. So the idea that the only time a queen of heaven ever appears in scripture, that it is in a negative context, is absolutely fallacious. It is not true. 
This is why we are talking about this. This is why we are delving into this deep, theologically rich information today on the Feast of the Queenship of St. Mary, very heavily tied in to the bodily assumption of Holy Mary into heaven. She was taken body and soul into heaven at the end of her earthly life. This is very important, importantly connected. It's very crucial that we lay out the theology from the scripture for you. Because once we get to what the Pope has to say, by the way, Vatican.va, great for the, we're actually going to read everything the Pope says, and then we're going to actually go through the context of his. We're going to deal with his church father quotes. Isn't that cool? He's done the homework for us. But then, of course, we're going to add a few of our own that are not included in the Pope's uh, decree. But very importantly, you can check it out on Vatican.va. There'll be a link down there. Great, great, incredible job the Pope did. But before we get to that, really laying out the theological information, because you hear very often, well, the only time the Queen of Heaven ever does appear, it's condemnatory, this should not be utilized, what is going on, you Catholics don't know what you're doing, and the Catholics tend to get tripped up, tend to not be able to, to kind of, to be able to respond. The fact of the matter is that if we're going to utilize very elementary arguments like that by saying, well, Queen of Heaven is a pagan title, thaws it, can never be utilized in a positive sense. That really is narrow thinking. Very, it really is narrow thinking. And we think of uh, other examples of, of titles that may have their origin or may be quite prevalent within paganism. And are we then to never utilize them in an orthodox sense? It really is absolutely a nonsensical. Really great website, newadvent.org. You can, or if, you, if you've got the Catholic Encyclopedia in hard copy, which is much tougher to get, but I would recommend trying to get uh, that or in a digital edition to where you can utilize it offline. Uh, also fantastic, but it's free to be able to find uh, online New Advent. Very great, great resource, fantastic uh, material. I write, you mean you, you stop and you look at the rich theological information found within, uh, it really is second to none. Very, very much recommend it. But incredibly, people tend to forget also <laughs> that if you're going to utilize that kind of logic, you're going to have a problem as well with the title of God the Father. <laughs> because you look at the name, the Greek Zeus, uh, the Latin Jupiter, it literally means God Father, God the Father, the Father God. It's God the Father. So are we then going to be uh, wary of utilizing that? even though biblically it's very much very orthodox, scripturally, patristically, simply because there are negative connotations to it. This is really absolutely ludicrous. Ludicrous. There even, there's a lot of things that pagans did, titles that they utilized, uh, that they distorted, that they utilized in an incorrect, unorthodox manner, that within the one true faith, we utilize this in a proper manner. Indeed, the very fact that the only other time this appears in the scripture that you find the actual title condemned, why is it condemned? Because it's a fake deity. It's not a real deity. It is not a, there is really no Ishtar that exists that is a queen of heaven. It, that's why it's condemned. That's exactly why it's condemned. And that's exactly why the true queen of heaven is presented to us crowned in heaven in Revelation 12. The other one condemned very clearly because it's a counterfeit. The other one condemned because it's a demonic, a pagan distortion, a queen, a demonic queen of heaven, a counterfeit queen of heaven. Just like there are counterfeit Marys, which can be found within the, the Protestant world. That we believe that, Pro, that Holy Mary is misrepresented and distorted within Protestantism and as well within Islam. Massive distortions within those two faith traditions. So we've got to be very careful, very, very careful with uh, the kind of arguments we construct, the kind of arguments that we utilize. We all know about uh, the incredible, the incredible Pope Pius XII is a very important and crucial role in defining the dogma of the bodily assumption of Holy Mary 1950 in Munificentissimus Deus, <clears throat> people tend to forget in 1954 his incredible proclamation of the title of the Queenship of Mary, indeed uh, the theology behind that being so closely 
uh, directly tied in with Holy Mary's bodily assumption into heaven. People tend to forget that. People tend to hear of uh, Mary as queen of heaven and tend to uh, perhaps want to turn a blind eye and say, well, maybe, you know, maybe that is something that uh, we can avoid. And, you know, I'm not so comfortable utilizing that title for Mary, but indeed it is an official uh, feast. It is an official role of Mary, her being the queen of heaven. She is queen of heaven. The queenship of Mary is indeed incredibly important. It is not something that we can merely swipe away and ignore because it is so connected, strongly connected with the bodily assumption of Mary that people at times tend to forget that. And it is really important that we emphasize that today. In 1954, Pope Pius XII, on proclaiming the queenship of Mary to the venerable brethren, the patriarchs, primates, primates archbishops, bishops, and other local ordinaries in peace and communion with the Holy See. Venerable Brethren, health and apostolic blessing. From the earliest ages of the Catholic Church, a Christian people, whether in time of triumph or more especially in time of crisis, has addressed prayers of petition and hymns of praise and veneration to the Queen of Heaven. And never has that hope wavered, which they place in the mother of the divine King, Jesus Christ. Nor has that faith ever failed by which we are taught that Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, reigns with a mother's solicitude over the entire world, just as she is crowned in heavenly blessedness with the glory of a queen. Which, again, <laughs> pausing briefly, is incredibly biblical. Look at the masterful biblical language theology behind it. Of course, she's crowned in heavenly blessedness with the glory of a queen. What do you think the image that we are seeing of her in Revelation 12 is? Indeed, the royalty given to Mary is present at the greeting of the archangel Gabriel to her when he greets her as Chaire Kesharitomene, hail full of grace. Following upon the frightful calamities, which before our very eyes have reduced flourishing cities, towns, and villages to ruins, we see to our sorrow that many great moral evils are being spread abroad in what may be described as a violent flood. Occasionally, we behold justice giving way. And on the one hand and the other, the victory of the powers of corruption, the threat of this fearful crisis fills us with a great anguish. And so with confidence, we have recourse to Mary, our queen, making known to her those sentiments of filial reverence, which are not ours alone, but which belong to all those who glory in the name of Christian. Did you catch that? We have recourse to Mary, our queen, making known to her those sentiments of filial reverence, which are not ours alone. So theologically rich is this incredible, uh, incredible letter. It is gratifying to recall that we ourselves on the first day of November of the Holy Year 1950, before a huge multitude of cardinals, bishops, priests, and of the faithful would assemble from every part of the world, and define the dogma of the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into heaven, where she is present in soul and body, reigning together with her son, amid the heavenly choirs of angels and saints. Moreover, since almost a century has passed, since our predecessor of immortal memory, Pius IX, the great Pius IX, proclaimed and defined the dogma that the great mother of God had been conceived without any stain of original sin, we instituted the current Marian year. And now it is a great consolation to us to see great multitudes here in Rome, and especially in the Liberian Basilica, giving testimony in a striking way to their faith and ardent love for their heavenly mother. Something we've got to double down on. We love our Eastern brothers and sisters. We love them with all our heart. Uh, but this is an area where, unfortunately, they're moving further away from us. Pope Pius IX was of the mind of the early church in very clearly defining Mary being immaculately created. The immaculate conception is the teaching that, unfortunately, our Eastern brothers and sisters slowly move further and further away from. We can only be saddened because the great Eastern fathers, Josef Briennios, 
Gregory Palamas, Nicholas Cavasilas, and oh, and on and on. Mark of Ephesus believed in the all immaculate conception, the all immaculate creation of Saint Mary. Modern day uh, Eastern Orthodox, unfortunately, uh, seem to be losing this incredible testimony of the faith of their ancient patriarchs, their ancient patriarchal figures, their ancient fathers. That is a an un most unfortunate thing. Mariology is incredibly important, not because we worship Holy Mary, but because it points to the incredible importance, the incredible beauty of our Christological faith, our Trinitarian faith. It draws you closer to Holy Mary's Son, our incarnate Lord and Savior. We only got, worship God and God alone. We venerate St. Mary. In all parts of the world, we learn that devotion to the Virgin Mother of God is flourishing more and more. And that the principal shrines of Mary have been visited and are still being visited by many throngs of Catholic pilgrims gathered in prayer. It is well known that we have taken advantage of every opportunity through personal audiences and radio broadcasts to exhort our children in Christ to a strong and tender love as becomes children for our most gracious and exalted mother. On this point, it is particularly fitting to call to mind the radio message which we address to the people of Portugal. When the miraculous image of the Virgin Mary, which is venerated at Fatima, was being crowned with a golden diadem, we ourselves call this the heralding of the sovereignty of Mary. And now that we may bring the year of Mary to a happy and beneficial conclusion, and in response to petitions which have come to us from all over the world, we have decided to institute the liturgical feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Queen. This will afford a climax, as it were, to the manifold demonstrations of our devotion to Mary, which the Christian people have supported with such enthusiasm as we should. In this matter, we do not wish to propose a new truth to be believed by Christians. This is so important. This is important. This is the heart of what I'm doing today. What I want to bring to mind, what I want you all to realize, that this is not anything new. These are not new arguments being set forth. This is nothing new. This is so strongly intertwined with St. Mary as the new Ark of the New Covenant is presented in Revelation 11, connected to the great woman crowned in the heavens with a crown of 12 stars on her head in Revelation 12, because that new Ark is all holy. This is biblically based, and it was believed and taught by the early church as well. This is not a new truth that is being proposed here. And Pope Pius is clear to lay that out, that the title and the arguments on which Mary's queenly dignity is based have already been clearly set forth and are to be found in ancient documents of the church and in the books of the sacred liturgy. How many popes do you know or how many are going to lay forth their incredible theology and then they begin to name church fathers? Pope Pius XII has given us a cheat sheet and he's named a bunch of incredible fathers in this, um, in this letter of his, we're going to look at them in just a bit. He's done the hard work for us. He's done the homework because it's not a difficult thing to do. Because the church knows that this title of Mary, as the Pope says, is found in ancient documents of the church and in the books of the sacred liturgy. So important to emphasize. This really is why we cannot emphasize enough the incredible importance of Pope Pius XII in what he did for Holy Mary, his magnificent, incredible, never-ending devotion to St. Mary, realizing that, look, we are living at, the, at his time, and even now, for that, for that matter, even now, in tumultuous time, in a very tumultuous period, what we've got to do is cling close, to, close as we can to Holy Mother Church, pray for our priests and bishops, but all the while doing that, realizing that honoring uh, Holy Mary, honoring St. Mary, indeed does bring you much closer to her son. I, I think that's the one point he was really trying to drive home. The theologians recognized that. The great church fathers recognized that. They had no problem giving veneration to Holy Mary because they knew it would drive and bring people closer to her son. They didn't view it as idolatry. Come on, who's going to view venerating a woman that you view as a creature? A creature. We say it over and over. A creature as idolatry. 
Idolatria would be what was given to the golden calf in the Old Testament. Idolatria would be worshiping something in the place of God, giving sacrifice to something, offering up sacrifice to something in the place of God, elevating, perhaps having a undue obsession. You could even make money into an idol. You can make anything into an idol. But if you are venerating St. Mary and saying, this woman brings so much love into my heart and makes me want to worship her son more because of the great things he did for her and the great things I hope he will do for me. Then that is incredibly wholesome. And we applaud that. From early times, Christians have believed, and not without reason, that she of whom was born the Son of the Most High received privileges of grace above all other beings created by God. If you need any more evidence of this, if you need any more evidence, go to Luke 1. See how Mary being full of grace is so importantly connected to Genesis 3 and Ephesians 1. And if you haven't yet, uh, another yet another shameless plug for our book on Mary, not because, not because we want to make money or become rich off of doing this. Come on, we, nobody's going to become rich off of selling books. Um, but because we want to draw you closer to Holy Mary. If you haven't read our book yet, The Definitive Guide for Solving Biblical Questions About Mary, Mary Among the Evangelists, please consider checking it out in Kindle or getting a, um, uh, an actual physical copy. So we can look at these incredible titles, and we also include the incredible titles of our Lord there. So interconnected. Because to have a proper Christology, you've got to have a proper Mariology, and a proper Mariology gives you a proper Christology. They go hand in hand. He will reign in the house of Jacob forever. The Prince of Peace, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when Christians reflected upon the intimate connection that obtains between a mother and a son, they readily acknowledge the supreme royal dignity of the mother of God. Supreme royal dignity of the mother of God. Pope Pius XII had an incredibly beautiful devotion to sacred, to St. Mary, to the sacred, particularly to Holy Mary. Oh, that we have only a fraction, at least a fraction of that beautiful devotion he had to Mary. Look at the beautiful love he has as he looks at St. Mary, knowing that Mary's complete obedience to the word. Let it be done to me according to thy word. The first to hear and vouch say, the Lagos in her heart, she then carried that Lagos incarnate in her womb, gave birth to the Lagos, our Lord and Savior, the Son of Man, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord that appears in the Old Testament. What a beautiful, beautiful theology we have within our supernatural texts of Scripture. Lord, I love your word, and I love your incarnate word, and I love your holy mother. I recognize there's a creature like the great Pope Pius XII did. But the greatest of all creatures, the greatest of your creations. What beautiful theology. And if you've been edified thus far, we are not done. <laughs> We're not done. Uh, hopefully you are. Hopefully you've gone to Mass. You've had a great time. Uh, if you're like me, which people think I'm weird, I, I celebrate every wonderful feast day of the church. <laughs> yeah, I try to celebrate every single wonderful one if I'm able to, uh, uh, if I am at home, uh, Texas style, barbecue. Uh, barbecue, good drink, and uh, veneration of Holy Mary and a great worship of our triune God. If you have gotten, if you've gotten a chance to get to Mass and you're enjoying the show in the evening, don't forget, coming up right after this, if you are Hispanic or Spanish-speaking, or if you're not and you know people that are, tell them, hey, tune in. There's going to be the exact kind of show being done in Spanish, 100% Spanish, with new translations of Church Father texts that are nowhere in Spanish that we have provided that you're going to be able to check out, God willing. What incredible theology that is biblically based. In a bit, we're going to see the incredible theology of the church fathers as well. 
king of kings and lord of lords. And when Christians reflected upon the intimate connection that obtains between a mother and a son, they readily acknowledge the supreme royal dignity of the mother of God. Hence, it is not surprising that the early writers of the church called Mary the mother of the king and the mother of the Lord, basing their standing on the words of the archangel, the great Saint Gabriel, who foretold the son of Mary would reign forever. The words of Saint Gabriel, the archangel, who foretold that the son of Mary would reign forever. And on the words of Elizabeth, who greeted her with reverence and called her the mother of my Lord. Thereby, they clearly signified that she derived a certain eminence and exalted station from the royal dignity of her son. Now, since the great Pope Pius XII provided us with so many incredibly amazing quotes from early church fathers, we are going to present them with beautiful images to give honor and veneration to St. Mary. And uh, a couple of, that are uh, not found in the writings of Pope Pius XII, who stick around, that uh, we have provided for translations that are from scholars that I know and incredible information behind it to show you the very clear biblical and patristic basis of Mary as Queen of Heaven, the queenship of Mary. Have you enjoyed this thus far? If you have, and if you're tuning in live right now in the chat, smash that like button in the chat. Tell me what's up. Tell me you've been enjoying it. And do me a favor. Come on. For the algorithm, I want these videos to get viewed more, not because it, it it not because I go to bed and say, look at all the views I'm getting. No, but because if you leave a comment below, for the algorithm, these videos get viewed more by people that maybe are struggling with this belief, that need to hear this truth, that need to learn this theological teaching, and the video will get seen more. Mm -hmm. Leave a comment down below. I don't care if you just say William, or just say good, or just say thanks. <laughs> anything please consider leaving a comment down below god bless you if you do smash that like subscribe if you haven't yet consider supporting us if you haven't yet as i say it very often your support and patreon goes a very long way it allows us to publish books it allows us to get translations done it allows us to work on stuff more but above any kind of support and patreon above any kind of membership on youtube above all of that the number one support that I'd like for you will take just, just five seconds, if you will. Perhaps longer if you're kind enough. And the support of praying for me, above all, is what I need. Pray for me. At the end of our um, presentation of images, I will show you the, the actual sources where you can find the quotes. Um, because I take it directly from the Pope, which incredibly includes all of them, I will provide that to you at the end. And of course, the information that is not available from Pope Pius XII, not published there, I have provided myself, including a uh, unique translation I've talked about a lot. I presented a few times, going to present it again here to uh, supplement the magnificent theology of the queenship of uh, Holy Mary. One particularly father he does bring up that I emphasize we need to learn more about as Catholics is a great doctor of the church, St. there from the deacon. Let heaven sustain me in its embrace because I am honored above it. For heaven was not thy mother, but thou hast made it thy throne. How much more honorable and venerable than the throne of a king is her mother. And in another place, he thus prays to her, majestic and heavenly maid, lady, queen, Protect and keep me under your wing, lest Satan, the sower of destruction, glory over me, lest my wicked foe be victorious against me. St. Ephraim is one of the greatest church fathers we can venerate and honor. Great Syriac church father. I recommend anybody, if you are unaware of who this incredible father is, you got to check him out. You've got to do more digging. You've got to learn more about him. I've done a number of shows on him. God willing, hopefully, I will do more in the future. We've got to learn more about the great Ephraim. Magnificent early church father. St. Gregory Nassianzen. He calls Mary the mother of the king of the universe and the virgin mother who brought forth the king of the whole world. While Prudentius asserts that the mother marvels that she has brought forth God as man 
and even as supreme king. Wow. Just magnificent. St. Jerome tells us we should realize that Mary means lady in the Syrian language. St. Peter Chrysologus says the Hebrew name Mary means domina, lady in Latin. The angel, therefore, calls her lady so that the mother of the Lord, whom the authority of her son made and caused to be born and to be called the lady, might be without servile fear. Epiphanius of Constantinople said that the unity of the church would be preserved by the grace of the holy and constant, consubstantial trinity and by the prayers of Mary, our lady, the holy and glorious virgin and mother of God. St. Andrew of Crete tells us his ever-virgin mother, from whose womb he, being God, took on human form. He today transports from earthly dwellings as queen of the human race. Also, the queen of the entire human race, faithful in reality to the meaning of her name, who is exalted above all things, save only God himself. Can we say enough about the magnificent St. Andrew of Crete, who is known as a great Dormition and Assumption father who tells us, well, Mary died, but Mary didn't die because of original sin. And Mary was all holy and immaculate. She was immaculately created. And Mary was ever virgin mother of God, bodily assumed into heaven. If St. Andrew of Crete is not a household name for you yet, when it comes to magnificent Mariology, I don't know when he will become one. But he should be one already. He should be one already. St. Germanus of Constantinople, another magnificent, um, incredible father. We frequently hear of him and we frequently refer to him again when talking about the bodily assumption of Mary the Dormition of St. Mary, another fantastic church father, another one stylized as an Assumption Dormitionist father, says, Be seated, lady, for it is fitting that you should sit in a high place, since you are a queen and glorious above all kings. Incredible, incredible. Uh, the queenship language right there, very obvious. And the great St. John of Damascene, St. John of Damascus, I mean, I could replicate tons of quotes of him calling Mary a queen. Here he calls her queen, ruler, lady. There are so many examples. This is just one. So many that can be found in the great St. John ja Damascene. What is so consistent with the great Dormition and Assumption Fathers, what is so consistent with him is the fact that all the while calling Mary queen of heaven, they will clearly teach the teaching of Mary being bodily assumed, body and soul into heaven. They'll also teach Mary as I.e. Parthenos, ever virgin, holy mother of God. And they clearly teach that she was immaculately conceived. What a magnificent, incredible layers of theology and magnificent early church father. Just tons of great theology you find in these geniuses. An anonymous Eastern father calls her the perpetual queen beside the king, her son, whose glorious head is crowned with a golden diadem. Saint Idelfonsus of Toledo proclaims, O oh my lady, my ruler, thou who governs me, mother of my lord, lady among the handmaids, queen among sisters. Great, incredibly beautiful language and, and very consistent with everything we've been seeing so far in the early church fathers, in those great Assumption and or Mission fathers. You find it all over the place, this very clear, biblically-based, uh, scripturally-based tradition, divine tradition-based teaching. You're also going to find it in the 5th century, St. Jacobus, the Council of Nisibus. You don't hear of this very often. You don't hear of this one very often, but this is a very significant one as well. Now, of course, we recognize it yield to the fact that it's not an ecumenical council, but we will look at ecumenical councils that do talk about Mary being queen of heaven, the queenship of Mary. 
St. Jacobus at the Council of Nisibus in the 5th century. The church on high and that below cried out with one hymn. For neither those above nor those below could suffice to tell of her. The ranks of that exalted assembly cried out from this one to that one that they might shout their praises. The air dropped living rain and the bones of the sons of the church, daughter of the Arameans, who did not deny her. She wove a beautiful crown. She wove a beautiful crown and set it on her sublime head on which valuable pearls were laid. This theology of the bodily, the Dormition of Mary and the bodily assumption of Mary, tied right in with Mary as Queen of Heaven. There is a beautiful crown on her royal holy head on which valuable pearls were laid. St. Jacobus, the Council of Nisbis in the 5th century, that's amazing. Any which way you look at it, that is incredible, incredible language that we find here. Just really, really valuable, valuable theology. And indeed, we're going to look at many more layers, just incredible layers of theology that we find. Things that maybe you may not be aware of and you may say, well, okay, well, uh, I guess this uh, this was more common than we, you know, than maybe we uh, we realized to begin with. But there's just so much. There really is so much. In a moment, we will look at, well, as well, at the uh, the first reformers. But this isn't the only council. There are ecumenical councils as well that talk about the queenship of Mary. The third council of Constantinople talks about Mary as despoina, a queenly title. In a letter to St. Germanus, the patriarch, as we just talked about a moment ago, uh, in a letter to him, uh, Pope Gregory II talks about Mary's queenship being universal. He calls her the ruler of all Christians. We notice that we've seen that multiple times already. He talks about it in many areas, many areas. And another council you may not know about, but all the while talking about duluo that should be given to the sacred image, to the, to the great saint, the sacred image represents at the great second council of Nicaea in reference to images. It talks about images of St. Mary, refers to them as our undefiled lady or holy mother of God. The particular language of uh, Domine, Dominae, Domine. I, I'm trying to remember exactly how it's laid out. I don't remember the exact original language of how it's laid out, but essentially it equals, it amounts to the very same thing, the very same theology that we're breaking down here. That's very important that we've got to emphasize. And, it, you know, funny enough, interestingly enough, we're going to look at language from the very first reformers as well or forerunners of the Reformation as well. What did what did guys like Wycliffe, Luther, what did they have to say about the queenship of Mary? Was this part of their theology? Were they aware of it? Did they approve of it? So that's very important. And we, we clearly looked at the important language of Revelation 12. But does, is there any support of that, of Revelation 12? Indeed, Indeed, providing a perhaps a patristic basis for interpreting it not only as Holy Mary, but as, as as relevant to the queenship of Mary and Mary as Queen of Heaven. Where is this in the patristics tied into Revelation 12? That would be the cherry on the top, wouldn't it? That would be real, real gold. We've gone through clear scripture. We've gone through magnificent early church councils. Great church fathers. What is the problem with viewing Holy Mary, the perpetual virgin and mother of God, our immaculate mother Mary, as the queen of heaven? If she was bodily assumed in heaven, which was part of the liturgical life of the early church, it is an ancient belief. It is a biblically based belief. And if that is true, then the imagery of scripture is true. If Mary is the new ark of the new covenant and everything else we say about her. And if all of that is true, then we should be able to call her the Queen of Heaven. Not the counterfeit, 
demonic version of the queen of heaven that demands worship that is a distortion of scripture distortion of the, what yahweh wants god almighty wants you to worship god and god alone and to honor or as revelation 3 says to bow before creation to show that you're loved that's what the bible wants not for you to worship a pagan deity thus we do venerate the true queen of heaven. Thus, we do condemn pagan counterfeits because we only worship the one true God. We only worship our holy triune God. Very important theology to break down. People tend to forget that Luther, Martin Luther, retained much of its Mariology throughout the course of his life. Now, it really cannot be denied, and it would be a distortion of the truth to claim that Luther held to uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, for instance, throughout his whole life. Very clearly did not. Did he hold to Mary being Queen of Heaven, bodily assumed, i.e. Parthenas, perpetual virgin, and Mary as Theotokos, mother of God, throughout the tenure of his life, throughout his whole life? There, really, there's no doubt he did. He did, of course, he... He really continues his attacks on the church and really unfortunate misrepresentations as well throughout his life. That remains a very constant and a very consistent theme within his writings. But to claim that his, he had a low Mariology uh, is a bit shocking and a bit perhaps laughable when we look at the Mariology of modern day Protestants, which is downright um, embarrassing. I mean, good luck finding a Protestant church that um, venerates Mary. Good luck finding one that uh, that calls her perpetual virgin, queen of heaven. They even don't even want to call her mother of God. They'll they'll shudder at it and they'll say, well, oh, yeah, it's a Christological title. <laughs> we don't deny it's a Christological title. By the way, that has become a battle cry for them. In fact, every time they admit, well, you know, you know, we got no problem calling her uh, mother of God, they'll then follow it up right away by saying, well, it's a Christological title. As if when that title was officially given to St. Mary, as if they agree with all the other theology surrounding it. They don't. So to then say, well, it's a Christological title, as if you agree with all the Christology or Trinitarian theology at these councils is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, we would argue that, uh, of course, they don't agree with the Mariology of, of, of the great St. Cyril of Alexandria, who was such a pillar and defender of Mary as Teotokos. So it, it becomes a little bit unfortunate on that end. But uh, again, remember that very common. You hear Protestants today, well, oh, you know, we agree Mary's mother of God. That's a Christological title. Right away, they're going to follow it up with that. As if we deny that, we don't deny it. All of Mary's roles are pointed towards a proper Christology. <laughs> Nobody's going to argue that. But very important that we lay that out. Luther was clearly very different. His theology remained, even though, of course, in much of it changes as time goes on. He uh, his, his view of purgatory becomes very, unfortunately, distorted. He's unable to refute it. But it becomes very, very poor, a very low level of it, uh, to even to the point of, uh, of utter denial <clears throat> of belief in purgatory. Luther's Mariology uh, gets to the point where he's just he is so anti-Catholic that anything he sees Catholics doing, he's going to have to criticize and attack. It's an unfortunate thing. It's a real thing. It's a reality. That is Martin Luther. And it's something that uh, there's really not a whole lot we can say other than we don't agree with that. But... But here's the important thing, even though we may not agree with it, his Mariology is much higher than modern day Protestants, and he still had incredible things, important things to say about Mary. Why are they important? They show you that Protestantism's Mariology would begin to disintegrate slowly over time, slowly over time. So Luther had no problem in his commentary on the Magnificat. He had no issues saying that it is necessary also to keep within bounds and not make too much of calling her Queen of Heaven. So number one, he recognizes Queen of Heaven is a valuable and a proper title to give to Mary. But he says, let's not make too much of it. But it's a true enough name, he says. And yet it does not make her a goddess, and nobody argues she's a goddess, who could, who could grant gifts or render aid, as some suppose when they pray and flee to her 
rather than to God. So number one, he doesn't oppose intercession of the saints. He doesn't oppose that. But he says, let's keep within uh, normal boundaries. Let us realize uh, we can call her Queen of Heaven. It is a true enough name. But let's not flirt with uh, imprudent measures that lead you to idolatry, which there's no example of any pope or any counter-reformer at the time doing it. No example at all. No example of Johann Eck or anyone doing that. So uh, Luther, of course, is always going to have to get a negative anti-Catholic jab in there. This for him was his negative anti-Catholic jab. But he doesn't deny calling the Queen of Heaven. He doesn't deny it. That's such an important point we've got to make that, uh, you know, it's really not being done. Pointing this out and really examining it is not getting done enough. And we need to realize, okay, well, this is this was done. It was even done by John Wycliffe, who says, it seems to me impossible that we should obtain the reward of heaven without the help of Mary. There is no sex or age, no rank or position of anyone in the whole human race, which has no need to call for the help of the Holy Virgin. That's very important, important theology. So you, they call him a, the great um, uh, forerunner of the Reformation. And of course, the very first reformer himself says, Queen of Heaven is a true enough name. So what's the issue with modern day Protestants? It is what we call a disintegration of true Mariology. A low Mariology, which is not representative of scriptural Mariology, not representative of patristic Mariology, and definitely not representative of Reformational or the Reformation Mariology. It is a very distorted one, as those of the Reformation believed in the bodily. Some of them, not all. A lot don't even talk about it. A lot don't even talk about it, but they don't deny it. The bodily assumption of St. Mary, Mary's Queen of Heaven, the title is rightly granted her, is uh, all of the early, the very first pillars of the Reformation believed Mary was bought, was, was perpetual virgin, i.e. Parthenos. Some believed her to have been all holy and sinless. Without a doubt, believed she was mother of God. So today, this lack of honor given to Mary is a novelty within the world of Protestantism, because Protestantism continues to move further and further away from apostolic-based Christianity, and that's a major problem. Uh, but they do it because they, they think if we venerate Mary, uh, we are too Catholic, we can't do that. Thus, we have to draw further and further away from any any kind of honor given to Mary. And really, it, it is unfortunate because they resemble nothing. They really don't resemble much or anything at all of apostolic Christianity. And thus, this is why they are doing damage control, <clears throat> trying to distort the fathers to represent them more. But indeed, the early church fathers were not proto-Protestants or Protestant in their thinking and in, in any way at all. That is something we must double and triple and quadruple down upon. They were not proto-Protestant in any way whatsoever. We briefly talked about how we were going to delve into the importance of the interpretation of Revelation 12 and the queenship of Holy Mary. Indeed, here is the incredible thing for you. The very oldest fully extant Greek commentary, note that down, the oldest extant Greek commentary on the book of St. John's Apocalypse, the book of Revelation indeed not only interprets Mary as the primary figure of Revelation 12, she is bodily assumed into heaven. She is the mother of the church. She is perpetual virgin. She is all holy sinless. She is mother queen of the church. She is the queen of heaven. Incredible in the oldest extant commentary on the book of St. John's Apocalypse. We cannot emphasize how important all of this teaching is, we have got to really stop and say and realize this is all essential to our faith, magnificent. We're talking about the Greek commentary of Oikumenios. Oikumenios, indeed, provides us a treat when he, in his commentary, repeats Revelation 12. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. 
And on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was with child and she cried out in her birth pains in anguish for delivery. By the way, just as the fathers read this in a metaphorical manner, what many of us does as well, perhaps one day we will do a show just on what the birth pains mean. We've shown very clearly they are metaphorical, not actual birth pains that, um, that Holy Mary underwent. She had a painless childbirth. Oikumenia says, since again the Lord's physical conception and birth marked the beginning of his incarnation, the vision has brought into some order and sequence the events which it is going to explain. By starting this explanation from the physical conception of Christ and by depicting for us the mother of God. So, boom, you got it right there. This is talking about the mother of God. But why does he say, and a great sign and a portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet? Why? He is speaking of the mother of our Savior. As I have said, naturally, the vision describes her as being in heaven and not on the earth, as pure in soul and body, as equal to an angel, as a citizen of heaven. So the bodily assumption is in view here. Mary has a crown on her head. She's presented as the queen of heaven. But you might say, well, where is the queenship language to tie into this beautiful feast? As equal to an angel, as a citizen of heaven, as one who came to affect the incarnation of God, who dwells in heaven. For he says, heaven is my throne. Ucumenias will not let us down. He says... And on her head, a crown of 12 stars. For the virgin is crowned with the 12 apostles who proclaim the Christ while she is proclaimed together with him. He's presenting her as a queen in heaven. She is crowned, he tells us, says she is sublime. Moral language indicative of her being a queen in heaven. Isn't this amazing? The oldest extant Greek commentary of the book of St. John's Apocalypse confirms that Pope Pius XII indeed was correct in his saying this is an ancient title that belongs to Holy Mary. On and on again, all throughout history, our incredible saintly popes have been vindicated when they say this is the mind of the church. This is the faith of Holy Mother Church. This is the faith of our Catholic Church. And it is a faith that will never crumble to the feet of heresy ever. Incredible, isn't it? Magnificent words we read from Oikumenias. It is perhaps best to close out our deep, multi-layered examination by reading the whole thing from the great Pope Pius XII. He says, the theologians of the church, deriving their teaching from these and almost innumerable other testimonies handed down long ago, have called the most blessed virgin the queen of all creatures, the queen of the world, and the ruler of all. The supreme shepherds of the church have considered that their duty to promote by eulogy and exhortation the devotion of the Christian people to the heavenly mother and queen. Simply passing over the documents of more recent pontiffs, it is helpful to recall that as early as the 7th century, our predecessors, St. Martin I, called Mary, our gloriously ever-virgin, St. Agatha, to great St. Agatha, in a synodal letter sent to the fathers of the Sixth Ecumenical Council, called her Our Lady, truly and in a proper sense, the Mother of God. In the 8th century, Gregory II, in the letter sent to St. Germains, the patriarch, and read in the Seventh Ecumenical Council, with all the fathers concurring, called the Mother of God, the Queen of All, the True Mother of God, and also the Queen of of all Christians. We wish also to recall that our predecessor of immortal memory, Sixtus IV, touched favorably upon the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin, beginning with the apostolic letter Comprix Celsa, with words in which Mary is called Queen, who is always vigilant to intercede with the king whom she bore. Benedict the Fourteenth called her, declared the same thing in his apostolic letter in which Mary is called Queen of Heaven and Earth. And it is stated that the Sovereign King has in some way communi communicated to her his ruling power. For all these reasons, St. Alphonsus Liguori, in collecting the testimony of past ages, writes these words with evident devotion. 
because the Virgin Mary was raised to such a lofty dignity as to be the mother of the King of Kings. It is deservedly and by every right that the church has honored her with the title of queen. Furthermore, the sacred liturgy, which acts as their faithful reflection of traditional doctrine believed by the Christian people through the course of all the ages, both in the East and in the West, has sung the praises of the heavenly queen and continues to sing them. Ardent voices from the East sing out, O mother of God, today thou art carried into heaven on the chariots of the cherubim. The seraphim wait upon you and the ranks of the heavenly army bow before you. Further, O just, O most blessed Joseph, since you are sprung from a royal line, he has been, you have been chosen from among all mankind to be spouse of the pure queen, who in a way which defies description will give birth to Jesus the king. In addition, I shall sing a hymn to the mother, the queen, whom I joyously approach in praise, gladly celebrating her wonders and song. Our tongue cannot worthily praise thee, O lady, for you have borne Christ the king. You who has borne Christ the king are exalted above the seraphim. Hail, O queen of the world. Hail, O Mary, queen of us all. We read, moreover, in the Ethiopic Missal, O Mary, center of the whole world, thou art greater than the many-eyed cherubim and the six-winged cherubim. Seraphim, heaven and earth are filled with the sanctity of thy glory. By this encyclical letter, we are instituting a feast so that all may recognize more clearly and venerate more devoutly the merciful and maternal sway of the mother of God. We are convinced that this feast will help to preserve, strengthen, and prolong that peace among nations, which daily is almost destroyed by recurring crisis. Incredible, because that's the same case as today. Is she not a rainbow in the clouds reaching towards God? The pledge of a covenant of peace. Look upon the rainbow and bless him that made it. Surely it is beautiful in its brightness. It encompasses the heaven about which the circle of its glory. The hands of the Most High have displayed it. Whoever, therefore, references the Queen of Heaven and Earth, and let no one consider himself exempt from this tribute of a grateful and loving soul, let him invoke the most effective of queens, the mediatrix of peace. Let him respect and preserve peace, which is not wickedness, unpunished, nor freedom without restraint, but a well-ordered harmony under the rule of the will of God. To its safeguarding and growth, the gentle urgings and commands of the Virgin impel us, earnestly desiring that the Queen and Mother of Christendom may hear these prayers, these our prayers, and by her peace make happy a world shaken by hate. And may after this exile show unto us all Jesus, who will be our eternal peace and joy to you, venerable brothers, and to your flocks, as a promise of God's divine help and a pledge of our love from our heart, we impart the apostolic benediction. Isn't this incredible? The 11th day of October, 1954. Amazing. And of course, I everything has got to be presented. Sources are right here. I could never do anything without providing you all the actual sources. Y'all can pause this or rewind it or do whatever you need. To find the actual source material, all of it is included here. You can find it at the end of, um, of this uh, apostolic constitution. Very important. You can find it right here in uh, Vatican.va. Provides it. Uh, indeed, I'm trying to roll all the way to the top. So uh, it indeed is, is correct. You find it here in this incredibly magnificent letter. It's encyclical. And I keep saying letter. I, I, I mean, I use all these different words, but really, really, you've got to refer to this as a magnificent encyclical of Pope Pius XII. And it proclaims the queenship of Mary. But indeed, as we have looked at, as we've spent a bit of time on already, this is a biblically-based teaching. Now, you may be saying, well, William, there's so many other examples we can use. Um, and indeed, there are. I mean, there's so many other examples we can use. There's nobody denying that. Nobody denies that. But indeed, I, I mean, we can't put together a four or five-hour show because, uh, first off, after the show, we're going to have the Spanish one airing. So... Pray that that goes well. We have a good audience for that. Now, I know the premieres don't get a whole lot of people, as the live shows do, but either which way, share this with your friends. Hit like, share, subscribe, 
Share it on Twitter. Share it anywhere you can. Uh, greatly appreciate your support. It's just incredible. This is uh, a whole lot of more information could be presented, but we believe this is the heart and soul of what you can find in Scripture. Laying this out very clearly, Mary is presented as that royal new ark of the new covenant. That royal new ark appears in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, towards the end, connected with the imagery of Revelation 12. She's presented as bodily assumed there, but not only that, she's the queen of heaven there. And that's confirmed by the oldest Greek extant commentary of St. John's Apocalypse. And multiple early fathers, it's present in their theology as well from the earliest of times. This is very clearly apostolic teaching. Biblically based, divine, divine tradition, uh, very deeply steeped in our divine tradition as well. Part of the life of our liturgical faith. It's important that we hold to this, we cling to this belief. And today in the Feast of the Queenship of Mary, what are you doing? How are you celebrating Holy Mother, our Holy Mother Mary? How are you celebrating her today? How are you worshiping God today? Have you gone to Mass? I hope you have. I know a lot, a lot of people might say, you know, William, I've got a really packed day. I have not been able to. Or, you know, some people that might be ill and not healthy. And if that is the case, I am praying for you. Tonight, I'm praying for you. I, I, if you could just support me by praying back, praying, pray for me, pray for my family. And if you enjoy this video, again, for the algorithm, tell me down below, post on my community page, um, post on my Facebook wall if you want. Again, um, if you have me as a friend on Facebook, do that. Like our Patristic Pillars page, follow everything that we're doing for more updates, check out our blog, check us out on Twitter. And again, if you are so compelled to support us on Patreon, where there are exclusive Mariological courses that are there on Patreon, courses where I give, I teach Christology, Trinitarian theology, and Mariology in a one-on-one -on -one basis with classes every week or every other week, depending on my schedule. And, it, but I've said it many times, the greatest support that I could ever get are your prayers. Pray for me. Pray that our upcoming session in Spanish is edifying. And please don't forget the incredible role of Holy Mary. Don't forget that. God bless you. God keep you.